I'm gonna have the sound guy put microphones on this thing, and I hope it doesn't blow it out, but you'll get an idea. I wanna give you a before sound, what it sounds like with uncapped headers, and then after we get the three inch pipes on it. Let's do it. And we're gonna take it over to Goofy's. Goofy's. You old Goofy. <laughs> Okay, it's kind of exciting. We haven't heard this thing outside. Sure pretty. It's a beautiful car, isn't it? Sure is. Gonna be done soon. I think once it gets the exhaust on it, we've only got like a handful of little things left to do. Great. Okay, let me pump her a couple times. See how she cans off. It's gonna be a little bit loud. Uh-huh. You ready for this, Mary? No. I loved that sound as a kid, uh -huh. but I don't know if I love it as much right now. Oh. Perfect. Okay. Need some, need some fluid? Yep. All right. Okay, we'll throw a few quarts of fluid in that bad boy, top it off, raise it up on the rollback, and head over and have some exhaust put on. Sounds good. Sounds good? This yeah. Sounds nice, doesn't it? Oh, it sounds great. God, I bet your dad would have bought you one of these, huh, back in the day. Let's take this to drag strip. Put some fluid in it, Nancy. This time on Graveyard Cars, a rarely seen numbers matching 1973 Challenger. It's beautiful. Mark shows us the devil's in the details when you're doing a DIY Daytona. We had to have a company make these for us. These are unique. When Mark's daughter can't report for duty. Four kids now, and she's got her hands full. His wife suggests some new blood. Why not baptism by fire? Mopar Magic takes metal, mud, paint, and parts. But when fans cry for mud, I see what you write online. He asks Michael to fill in. This is a custom made piece, so we cannot destroy it. To show the fans that bodywork is more than just mudslinging. Plus, when a cracked block is saved, the pressure is on for Will to execute V5 perfection on a coveted CUDA. You're dealing with high end cars that need to look perfect. On this episode of Graveyard Cars. Beneath the fog, behind the rust, sometimes they come back. There's only one internationally recognized Mopar master, Mark Warman, joined by his friends, family, and dream team, the Ghouls. Nobody wants to take on the stuff that we take on. Reviving the past. 100% untouched survivor. Resurrecting the icons of American muscle. We are the Shaolin priests of Mopar. Uncovering stories. It's the baddest car we have here. And restoring dreams. The most iconic muscle car on the planet. Putting cars back where they belong. On the road. Here we go. Beyond a passion. Oh, that's wild. One man's obsession. <laughs> With Mopar Perfection, this is Graveyard Cars. Uh, you know, to catch everybody up on our 1973 Dodge Challenger Rally, that car, when it came to me, had all of the metal work done to it. And, and the owner who had it done believed it was a good job. He has no reason not to believe that. But when we got it here, we realized that it was a mess. Most of the panels that had been put on had either been put on in the wrong areas, so they weren't the, the correct fitment, or they were substandard repairs, meaning that you couldn't trust them to hold up in a collision. You wouldn't want to drive it down the road because they were unsafe. 
So when we started on that car, we had our hands full with metal. It took quite a while to get all of the panels replaced that they had put in that weren't right, as well as stuff that they had missed or that they had used something else over the top of a rust hole that really needed to be patched. So our job was to make sure that that car was perfectly ready to go over to the mudroom and move its way through the shop. So everybody in the Mopar world knows that the 72 to 74 E-bodies aren't nor will they ever be as popular as the 7071s. And primarily, not just because of looks and things like that or exterior cues, but because the last year you could get an E-body with a big block or a Hemi, which is also a big block, was 1971. So in 72, small blocks were all that were available the cars began to really get generalized. So a lot of the seat interior, I think even Cuda and Challenger use the same seats in 73 and 4. That's why the 72 to 4s don't demand the same money. They're just not as desirable. Now this car really did come out very pretty. I, it's funny, in, in fairness to Jim, the owner, I gotta give him some credit, he pushed on some things that I didn't want. I said, you're just, you're butchering it, man. Just let it be, let it be. He wanted the fillers to be black between the bumpers instead of the original gray. And I said, you're just, you're taking a real rally car, one of 4,840 or 4,860 made, and it's a numbers car, numbers matching, and you're just doing all this butchery to it. But when I stand back now and look at it, it's beautiful. It, it, it is, it has just the right amount of matte black. He didn't want to put the strobe stripes on, so we left those off. So when you set that car out in the middle of the room and you start walking around it, you realize it does look like it's going 100 miles an hour setting still, which is a great look. The ducktail spoiler, which I absolutely fought him on, I gotta say looks pretty good on the car. It, overall, it looks good. When Tony was out, we were talking quite a bit about the 72 to 4s not being as popular, but he agreed even when he was here that this particular car really was coming out beautiful. Now, another thing that the owner wanted to do on this car was add air conditioning. And this really worked out nice. We put one of the classic auto air retrofit kits in it. Under the hood of this car, it's pretty much original, except for the air conditioning compressor. Old Fred over at Be Cool always just takes my stupid drawings of what the radiator support looks like and what the opening sizes is and what the bolt patterns are. And he'll build me one in the spirit of an original one. I could paint it black, but it's aluminum. This guy didn't care. He kind of liked the idea of it, but you could have painted it black easy enough. Other than the numbers not being there, and at a glance, you might think that's an original radiator. So when you're looking at the car, remember, this was not a tribute car. It was a real Challenger rally car that he just chose to modify. So when you look at the rally instrument cluster, that's that came on that car that was standard on this particular one. The sport hood, the J54 sport hood, standard on that package. The cool louvers on the fenders, which I always loved. I had a Challenger of my own that it, one of the first small parts I did when I hung my shingle in 85 is a 72 Challenger. And I love those louvers. I, I did add the graphics on the side of it. But those look really neat on these cars and give it a bit of a racy look looking down the side. Flip top gas cap, same way. So overall, this was a pretty darn nicely optioned car. He did go for, I think it was a single outside mirror on the left-hand side originally, but we did the outside racing mirrors in chrome. But the rest of the trim and the ornamentation, other than the things I mentioned, are 100% factory. The interior of these cars definitely is a strip down in the way of luxury from the 70 and 71s. Like you couldn't get leather interior after 71 on these cars. Same seat kits that you'd see in a 73 Challenger, you see in a 73 Cuda. But it looks nice, right? It's a, it's a very utilitarian type of interior. It does have the rally instrument cluster, tinted glass because it's an air-conditioned car. We want to make sure all that stuff was right on it. Just because you're adding a few things to a car doesn't mean you get away from the spirit of originality. So when you open the trunk on that car, it's got a correct spare. It's got a correct jack. It's got a brand new filler neck for the fuel. It's got the jacking instructions, the rubber mat, all the provisions inside there that tell you the trunk assembly is correct. And that's the way it looked when you popped the trunk on a dealership floor in 1973. So all that being said, you stand back and you look and you've got a gorgeous 73 Challenger Rally with some modifications to it, but acceptable modifications that you know is done right, gorgeous, and ready to go home. Now, if you guys recall last season, we had a 383 
that was had a freeze crack, a bad freeze crack. The valley busted out on both sides. The side of the block was cracked around all the freeze bugs. That was the numbers matching original engine for a 71 Cuda. Very rare car, B5 blue, leather interior car, gorgeous stuff. Well, when the guy bought the car, he bought it knowing it was a numbers matching engine car, so he paid. The, his money his, that he spent reflected a numbers matching car. So when we discovered that, I thought, boy, if there's any way in the world that we can save the engine, if you remember. So we sent it out to the guys in Portland who just went to work on it. And it was a long story and it's an old episode. You should watch it. But we were able to save the numbers matching engine for a very, very rare and very beautiful and very good 1971 CUDA 383 automatic. Once we determined that we were able to fire up the engine and it ran and it held fluids, other than Dougie's little mishap, we sent the car over to Will and let him continue on his path. So once Mark realized he was gonna be able to save the numbers matching engine for this CUDA, he was able to turn the body over to me. You know, one of the nice things is when you get a car back from the dipper, and the metal's pretty good. It goes through the metal shop fast, and at that point, we can kick it right out to the mud room where their job is even quicker. So when it comes to doing the mud work on the side of a CUDA, they got one body line that goes down the whole side right in the middle. To maintain that original body line, they mask it up, do all the mud on the top. Once that's done and it's straight and good, they mask off the top, and then they do the bottom. That way, you preserve that line from start to finish. When it comes to CUDAs, there's not a ton of body lines. Nothing really is tricky. The guys like doing them. They're super quick, which is good for us because we can get on it right away. So once we got the car, we did our normal prime, let it sit, car comes back in, we block it out, prime it again. And then at that point, we're able to disassemble the car and start getting it ready for jam work. So our 69 Daytona tribute car that I introduced last season, we went over the modifications that had to happen to the fenders, to the 70 Charger fenders, the cuts on the bottom to be able to allow the balance to go into place, very important. The correct diameter hole size on the tops of the fenders, which is, they were real holes on the Daytona where they weren't on the Superbird later. The scoops were more for looks. The correct mesh pattern, on the grills that went into those holes and the fitment of how all those things work together with a nose cone, with the valance, with the fenders all bolted onto a 69 body. All those pieces are in place. I wanted to take a minute and show you what they look like. All those attention to detail look like before the car gets mudded up and painted because everything looks great then. Why don't you see how it looks and fits in metal? Remember my theory now, just because you're building a tribute car doesn't give you carte blanche to butcher it. You want to do the exact same quality job converting a Charger over to a Daytona as you would if you had a real Daytona. Our wing, our Janik wing fiberglass is now in place. Look at the fit on the quarter. No weirdness there. Both sides, solid, even fit. Very thin layer of filler to smooth it out. Same thing on this side, perfect fit. You know, one thing that I am impressed with is the Janik reproduction parts. If you go back to the Superbird that we did, the Hellbird, with the Hellcat in it for SEMA 18, I think it was, 17 or 18, 17. You know, all that stuff fit really well. It's a lot of work to get it to fit really well. Well, even in just a few years since we bought a kit from them, a lot of the mentions that we made to them back then, they made those changes. And so Shane was saying a lot of this stuff fits pretty darn good. And it's, it's evident when you look at it, look at how all of the fitment on these parts is. The trunk lid has been converted. He's got a little bit of primer on it. As you can see, it's about nine inches shorter than an original one. When it goes up, it's not hitting the wing. We put it exactly where a factory Daytona was. Remember now, not long ago, we restored the Daytona that Tony and I were on the fence about whether or not we would restore it. So that car was that original. We had that as a template for everything we use on this Daytona. So the fitment, the height, all of that stuff is documented to be the way that we have this one. Something to point out is these hinges. We had to have a company make these for us. These are unique. On a Superbird, the sister to it, the stopper for the hinge 
that keeps it from going up too far is welded to the body. On a Daytona, if you look here, right there, you'll actually see that it's welded to the hinge. These are duplicates of the original Daytona hinges that were used. This filler piece at the front of the trunk lid, now that is identical except that it's fiberglass instead of steel. But if you look at my pictures of the original one, you'll see every conceivable detail was taken into account, including this huge gap over here. Look at my original one, you'll see a big gap. We didn't want it to look different. We want it to look like a Daytona. It has the gap. Trunk floor, of course, is just a charger trunk floor until you get out here to the ends where the brackets are. These are replicas of the original brackets that you can look at our Daytona and see that they're replicas. The only thing is these need to be painted black still. Following that OEM pattern on the Daytona that we took apart for the Waltons, the bolts went from the bottom up, just like on this one. But that doesn't mean they all were. Remember, these cars were sent out to creative industries where they were converted from a Charger to a Daytona. So maybe Billy Bob that was doing it this day stuck them up from the bottom. Maybe the next guy does what he thinks is right and puts them in from the top. There's no reason to believe there was one way or the other, but we have documented proof that they were from the bottom up, so that's what we did. If you look underneath here, you'll see the wing washer. These wing washers are made of fiberglass versus the original steel ones, but they're in the exact same location. If you look at the original pictures, you'll see all of the hardware, the locations, the fit, and the finish are identical to a real Daytona. Even take a look at these oddball Highland bolts. They go, why would they put Highland bolts in the trunk hinge? Well, you're gonna have to talk to Walter P. Chrysler because I don't have that answer. Everything, 100% the way it's supposed to be. Now, when he's done painting this, these areas will all be painted also the catch for the striker and catch. This catch will be painted in place, but we're gonna move it off to the side a little bit. We're gonna move it out of alignment where right now it's in perfect alignment. Paint it like they did at the factory. Then there should be a little mark where we readjusted it back to its correct position, but should be bare metal underneath it. That's the attention to detail. Granted, the VIN is never gonna say that this is a real Daytona, but the DNA of the car will. To me, I've done two Daytonas. I have never had one fit like this. I am just so proud of Shane. So when you stand back now, other than the vehicle identification number, the front end of that car looks like a Daytona Charger and it's right for a Daytona Charger. Huge kudos to the guys that did the metal work, Jason and, and Josh and Shane. It came out perfect. They are real craftsmen. Look at the gap between the hood and the nose cone. I mean, it's consistent. He shaped it. He's gone beyond whatever the factory would have done in the day or creative industries. Same thing on the fender. It's beautiful. This thing puckers out just the right amount. You look down here, it has a beautiful, just look at that side fit on the nose cone to the fender. Look at the balance to the fender fitment. There's no Daytona, I promise, anywhere in the world that has been put together with a better fit than that. And these are aftermarket replacement fiberglass parts. Headlight assemblies, functioning, except of course they're gonna be vacuum operated when we're done. But look at the clearance up through there, great clearance. Nice reveal around the headlight opening. We got our center grille section, lower valance. Everything on this front end of this car looks like 1969 Daytona. And that's our goal, right? That's what converting one right looks like. So at the end of the day, the metal guys did a fantastic job on the Daytona. I signed off on every corner of it and was able to ship it out to the mudroom. Just gonna switch up pads. This one's getting kind of dull. Don't waste your time with dull sandpaper. Especially doing filler work, you want to keep your sandpaper sharp, keeps everything nice and even, smooth, flat, the whole way through. And shoot up a bunch of sparks, isn't gonna grind it all out, and so on, and it allows you to kind of really get into some of these welded areas without cutting up your weld. Once we got the car kicked out to the mudroom, Michael, our lead guy out there in the mudroom, took over on it. Michael's been with us quite a while. If you looked at the black cars that we've done, the 71 Cuda, the 69 Hemi Charger, quite a few of the cars over the last three years, he's done the work on. He does beautiful work, whether it's a black car, white car, or yellow car, does phenomenal work. 
he got ready to start on the Daytona and I was talking to him saying we're getting a lot of questions, a lot of stuff in social media about what goes on in the mud room. I said, would you be willing possibly doing some stuff on the mud? You know the mud really well. Don't worry about whether you sound professional and polished. People are watching you out here in the mud shop because you know what you're doing. He said he was willing to do it. So we started working together on trying to bring you guys some more information, more knowledge, more tricks in case you're doing body work at home. Now, as you guys have seen many times, we talk about that when a car comes back from the dipper, we immediately prep it and spray DP90 on it, PPG's sealer that has acid etch in it so that it can't rust while it's waiting to go in the mudroom. Well, what happens once it goes in the mudroom? We have to strip that stuff back off again anywhere we're gonna be applying fillers. So right now, Michael's getting ready to do all the grinding, all of the preparation work for the areas he's gonna show you that he's working on. I don't really wanna shred into it too much because this is a custom made piece so we cannot destroy it. So what Michael's prepping out to do now is to use the fiberglass composite material. It is a plastic and a fiberglass designed to go over the top of fiberglass and over the top of metal, but it'll bridge that gap where the uh, rear window filler fiberglass meets the body, which is steel, and it will keep moisture from being able to come up through it because that's one of the nice things about this product. It will not absorb moisture or let it into it where regular filler will. This actually will hold it out. It also, because of the long strand fibers, will make it strong, solid, maybe even more solid than if it was all metal. Now we've exposed this rear window and you can see here a little bit of this metal edge right here popping through. That is the fin to the charger. Looks like a beautiful single piece. You can see here, this is the seam for the quarter. We're gonna go ahead and fill this as well and that'll completely fill this in and then we'll skim coat over it all. So when you see him masking an adjacent panel, there's a reason for that. It's cleanliness, it keeps you from getting the slag, the fiberglass slag or the mud filler slag on everything around it. It also gives you a really clean edge. If you take that tape off, right when the product is beginning to set up, you can have a beautiful edge that needs very little work on it. This 1970 Hemi Cuda is one of only 284 ever made with a four-speed manual transmission. Not only is it all numbers matching and loaded with options, it's also the subject of this week's autopsy report. So I am happy to announce that the autopsy reports are back. My daughter's not doing them this season just because she's at home. She's got four kids now. Three of them are at home and she's got her hands full and I love her and I know she'd be in here in a New York second if we needed her. However, I'm having a little mercy on her this season. My wife, God rest her soul, now she's still alive, had the idea the other day, I was saying, I gotta get somebody to do the autopsy report. So we ran, a, ran tape on a couple more people here we thought would work, didn't work out so well. Didn't work out and I wasn't gonna waste your time with it. Then she says, how about Annie? Little Annie in the office, little tiny Annie, about one foot tall, right? Annie does our social media. She's got, she's just as sweet a kid as the day is long. She wanted to do it, but she was very nervous about it. I said, everybody's nervous. If you look at some of those audition tapes, some of them never get over the nervousness. I believe that you will. So when she committed to doing the autopsy report, I thought, why not baptism by fire? All right, let's have a look at the fender tag. Remember, fender tags are red from left to right, bottom to top, so let's take a look. E74, 426 Hemi engine. D21, heavy duty four speed manual transmission. BS23, B stands for Barracuda, S stands for price class, which is special, meaning it's a CUDA model, and 23 tells us that it's a two-door hardtop. R0B, R stands for 426 Hemi engine, zero tells us the model year of the car, which is 1970, and B tells us where the car was built, which was Hamtramck, Michigan. And the last number on this line is the car's serial number, which is 223642. 
Moving up the line, we have the car's exterior body paint color, EV2 Tour Red, H6X9, all vinyl black bucket seats, 000 one piece interior door trim panel. C19 is the scheduled production date of the vehicle, which was December 19, 1969. 063843 is the car's unique shipping order number that is also found on the broadcast sheet and the window sticker. Moving up another line, the roof color of the car, EV2 Tour Red. A34, it has a super track pack, which means it has a four-speed manual transmission, a 410 Dana rear axle, power disc brakes, and max cooling. A62 Rally Instrument Cluster. B51 Power Disc Brakes. C16 Center Console. C55 Bucket Seats. Moving up to the next line, we have G36 Left and Right Hand Painted Racing Mirrors. J45 Hood Tie Down Pins, which is standard on all CUDA models. J54, this represents a sport hood normally, but the shaker hood cancels that out. M21, drip rail moldings. M25, body seal moldings. And M31, body belt moldings. Moving up another line, we have M88, deck molding treatment. N41, dual exhaust. N85, tachometer. N95, evaporative emissions control, which tells us this is basically a California car. And N96 is the shaker hood. Moving up to the next line, we have N97, the noise reduction package. R11, AM Music Master Radio. Y05, built to US specifications. And 26 represents the 26 inch radiator that comes with the max cooling package. And last but not least, we have EN1, which represents the end of our sales codes and the end of this week's autopsy report. All right, so right now we're gonna mix up some tiger hair. The tiger hair does a really good job on not causing any shrink back or swelling later on. This is a long strand reinforced, so you could see those long strands of fiberglass in there. And so that's what makes this a bit stronger, is those really long strands of fiberglass. Pretty much just use your regular blue hardener, give it a nice ribbon across the top there, and you're gonna get it all nice and mixed up. You really want to mix it well because especially with fiberglass resin, it does not harden if it does not have the hardener in it. So if you don't mix it well, you will have soft sections that will later come back and screw you. As I'm mixing it, you can see those nice long strands and it looks much different than other fillers. We'll go ahead and take this over to our panel. I'm gonna pretty much just go ahead, we're gonna fill this on here. The product, you only have a couple minutes to work with. This stuff, it is completely hard in about 15, 20 minutes. So it starts tacking up a lot sooner than that. You really only have about five minutes or so to really get it on the area that you need covered. That tape acts really nicely, allows me to just go straight up to it and over top of it, which later when I go and peel this tape, it'll have a nice even edge. And I'll be able to just take a razor blade and cut off any little bit of slag. And so that is pretty much it for the tiger hair. So filler's got kind of a bad rap to itself. A lot of people, you see those crazy videos where people are chunking off huge pieces of filler and having major failures. If you use the right materials the right way, you will have no failures. It is a guarantee you will see that car 20 years down the road looking beautiful. So it's something that is impervious 
to moisture so you can use it on the different seams, right? But it will build a lot more than plastic filler does. This, this product has the ability to really get some millage out of it. So when you see him laying that stuff on, keep in mind he's gonna carve two thirds of it back off again, but it's gonna leave a nice strip wherever he needed that Everglass as a substrate to go over the top of. Still to come, GYC's Mud Master Michael continues to dish out the dirt for our fiendish fans. You really want to utilize that time because this stuff gets harder than concrete. And with the numbers matching engine for our B5 Blue 71 CUDA successfully delivered from disaster, Boom. the CUDA can confidently continue into the paint booth to show the world why Will Scott gets paid the big bucks. Honestly, this doesn't have to be done by five o'clock. Finally, find out what happens when Mark's cousin Doug forgets about the cameras. I'm not gonna tell you something ain't wrong, something wrong with the guy. When Graveyard Cars returns. So once Mark realized he was gonna be able to save the numbers matching engine for this numbers matching CUDA, we got the car in the booth, disassembled it, and we start getting the jams ready for paint. Because he's been here a while, I've given Count Chocula a little more leash to go play. So I let him go in there, seal it. I'm trying to get him to paint. So the only way you're gonna do that is actually doing little stuff like this. He's doing great. Both my helpers are doing great. But you know, when you gotta make a TV show and these guys wanna paint, you gotta try to help them out as much as you can, which is quite challenging, but we got a pretty good process, which is fair for everybody. So this is a 71 B5 Blue. It's a lot like Wendell's car, and this is different from the 70 B5. It takes five to seven coats three coats of clear, pretty much what you do on the outside of the car is the same thing you have to do on the jams. It's more of a kind of a challenging color that metallic really wants to come out modelly, kind of blotchy, but everything came out great. And then we'll let it sit for a couple days and then put the car back together. So after all the jam work was wrapped up, I grabbed Josh to come over and basically put the car back together. He was the one that took it apart. We have him put it back together. So then at that point, we're ready to do a final block and it's ready to paint. So once the car was all reassembled, at that point, we blocked the car out with 600, give it a bath, put it back in the booth and it's ready to paint. So with this car being a metallic, just to be safe because my helpers still are learning, we sealed it with the DP50 just to make sure there wasn't anything missed. And because if, if there's a problem and if you see it in the sealer, you can address it way quicker. So I got one coat of sealer on it, give that about an hour, it's a long process. And then we go back in there, five to seven coats of color. It's the GB5 and it's different in 71 to 70. In 71, this color is the color of Wendell's car. In 70, it's the color of Wes's car that we did in earlier episodes, so quite different just one year. So after all the base coats done, at that point, depending on how much time is left in the day, I can either jump in and clear it, or I just kind of like to let it sit and wait till the next morning. You're dealing with high-end cars that need to look perfect. Honestly, this doesn't have to be done by five o'clock. So if we can get our color on, let it completely gas out, come in the next day with some fresh eyes, walk around the whole car, make sure, you know what, we're good to go. At that point, we'll clear it. So with this color, it's about five to seven coats. And I give it a good half hour in between each coat. And it takes 15, 20 minutes to get around the car one time. So it is, it does take quite a few hours to get the color done. Now that I've got this filled in, I'll go and take my DA, sand it, and then any more lows, I will come back through and fill those after, because you can always come back. You don't want to sand on it too early. You'll pull it straight off of the panel. But you can 
And I do recommend sanding it once it has tacked up enough that you can go ahead and touch it and it's not doing anything. Once it's starting to tack up, you really want to utilize that time because this stuff gets harder than concrete. And it is like sanding concrete once it is completely hardened. One thing you can see is that there's still metal all getting exposed here. We're really just filling in where this weld was. We're taking off a lot of what we put on already. Now, the main reason that Michael's using a DA right here, in case you guys are wondering, he's not block sanding it like we would if we needed to get a car flat. He's trying to take the bulk of the material off. Why waste your hands? Why waste all the energy when what you really need is just to kind of do a rough carving of everything. DAs work great. They're fast. You can keep the paper aggressive on there. You can use 36, 40 grit if you want to. At this stage, wouldn't want to do it later, but at this stage, and so when you see him using that, it's not that he's taking any shortcuts, he's just taking the path of least resistance and using a power tool in the proper way. So we've got a nice overall shape now. So really, when you see that filler going on, that's gonna be your last stage of filler work prior to primering. Once he has it all laid out, he's gonna go into it with 80 grit, then 120, then 220, and that's when they're gonna start doing their primer work. So he will work his way around the car as you've seen him do there. Each panel, panel for panel, each step in the same exact methodical way. So that when he's done going around the car, and I go out or Will goes out and we sign off on it, the car is perfect and ready for its initial primer. So right now I'm gonna mix up some of the Rage Ultra Premium Filler. This is our lightweight filler that we use. And we'll mix it with a little bit of the plastic honey. I'm on my way up to the top. I won't fall and I can't stop. It's the blood, sweat. Progress of the car's gone pretty well, pretty smooth. It's we haven't gotten too far. I'll go back through when it starts to tack up, and I'll poke back through those holes and clean up the slag on the backside. So I know some of you at home are probably going crazy seeing me cover those. <laughs> it's the blood, sweat, the tears, no fear. I'm on my way up to the top. I won't fall and I can't stop. It's the blood, sweat, the tears, no fear. Oh, oh, Coming up, Will clears out the CUDA from his busy schedule. And with his numbers matching B5 Beauty finally arriving in assembly, Mark and Doug can't wait to install the engine they nearly lost. Oh. Proving that even freeze-cracked blocks are no match for the ghouls when a numbers-matching CUDA is on the line. But when Mark and his cousin decide to work the weekend, Cousin Dougie takes on a whole new persona. He is a shy person by nature who wants to do really well and gets very, very nervous when he forgets about Mark's hidden cameras. In this case, it was GoPro, so he forgets they're there, see? Coming up, when Graveyard Cars returns. So with this car, we let it sit overnight. You come in the next morning, camera crew's ready to go, everyone has their coffee. I've already walked around the car to ensure that it's good. So at that point, we walk in the booth, I do three coats of clear, the 2002 clear, great product. 
65, 70 degrees, you know, a half hour in between each coat, and then I'll do all three coats, and then I walk out of the booth. Once Will finished all the paint work and the undercoating and all the steps on the 71 Cuda, Doug and I put the drivetrain in it. We do a lot of this stuff now where we used to cover it when we were doing, you know, two or three cars a year, but we're doing 12 to 15 cars a year. So it's hard to cover it all. I try to throw GoPros up. It just give you an idea or a sense of what's going on behind the scenes and kind of keep you up with the car because the next time you see the car, it'll be out here in the assembly shop and we'll be doing all the final steps on it. Just a reminder that we always install the rear end first in these cars when we're doing them on the bin pack lifts. That's because if you were to put that K-member with the engine and transmission in the front first without that counterbalance in the back, there's a pretty good chance the car would tip forward. We've seen it, we know it can happen. So we always start by installing the rear suspension. So you have your axle already built out. It's got the rear sway bar in this particular case, which is standard on the Cudas other than the Dana. It's got all the brakes, all the lines, everything's on it. All we have to do is install the leaf spring perches at the front, shackle mounts at the back. Next thing is your shocks. Get your shocks in place. And it's now in a position where we can move to the front of the car and do the front suspension. I would like to clear the air about Dougie being from another planet. Dougie is not from another planet. I know I started the rumor. Anybody who believes that's got issues anyway, he's something's wrong. I'm not gonna tell you something ain't wrong, something wrong with the guy. And it magnifies by a factor of 10 when the cameras are on. So sometimes you'll see us just working underneath there and say, well, where's all the chicanery? Where's that? Well, we don't manufacture that stuff. It's just, all you have to say is action. In this case, it was GoPro, so he forgets they're there, see? So we move along very smoothly. We're able to get to the front suspension. We're able to put all the pieces in. Nothing is forgotten. Like sometimes he gets crazy and we'll be rolling a car on the rollback to move it down to the storage. And I'll find out that there's no lug nuts on the wheel because he saw the camera and he got sidetracked. He, 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 he is a shy person by nature who wants to do really well in this show and gets very, very nervous. So at the end of the day, he's a phenomenal mechanic He's great on the show, everybody loves, oh, they like him a lot more than they like me and my big mouth and my big ears and my goofy looking eyeballs and all the things. I see what you write online. You think I don't read it? I do. I just don't comment back on it. The point isn't my hatred and contempt for those people. It's that my cousin is a good guy and does a fantastic job. So installing the front suspension, we've done a hundred of them. We didn't even show very much on it, but the installation of the K-member, which already has our engine and our transmission in place, four K-member bolts hold it there. Back at the back, it's a transmission cross member. There are four cross member bolts that go front to back on the cross member itself, plus the insulator bolts. That puts it in place. Then we just have the upper control arms and shocks to make the connections. Torsion bars have to be slid into place before that, by the way. Then we can put the wheels and the tires on it, lower it down and set it out in the middle of that room. And when you stand back at the end of a nice eight hour day and you look at what's happened in the last couple of weeks and setting out in the middle of the room, standing tall, knowing that this car is almost back to complete life form, makes everything we do at Graveyard Cars worth it, everything.